Now, 22 years on, the field has split into two major pursuits and about 100 minor pursuits. But the two major pursuits, the electrochemical loading of deuterons, deuterium atoms, heavy hydrogen atoms into palladium, Following along the initial uh, Fleischmann-Pons approach, this is called the Fleischmann-Pons effect. Most of the work in the field has been done in this area, and most of the work at SRI has been done to pursue this line of research. I'd say, you know, good 85% of everything that we have done here is uh, in this uh, first bullet. Much interest is developing now in the gas loading of protons, normal light hydrogen, into nickel. Uh, work began with Piantelli in, in Italy in 1993, actually, and the approach has been used by a man called Rossi, and I'll get to that at the end of my lecture because it's, it's interesting, provocative, uncertain, but, but, uh, but hot and interesting. And uh, some recent results at SRI seem to support the idea that nickel and light hydrogen also can produce uh, nuclear-level excess heat. Talk about Fleischmann and Pons early results. I'm going to teach you about calorimeters. As I say, I warned you, and there will be um, an exam afterwards. So I'm going to teach you enough electrochemistry to go home and do these experiments yourself. Talk about our uh, experiments and results. This result, by itself, with, with no more explanation really, is sufficient, if you believe uh, Fleischmann, is sufficient. To, to, to convince you that there is a real thermal, a real heat effect in the deuterium palladium system. This is an electrode being electrolyzed in a heavy water electrolyte, palladium cathode, the negative electrode. And you can see, I, I have to do this on both sides, I guess, but the line is rising. The uh, temperature is going up in the cell at constant power. Now, electrochemical cells will generally rise in Voltage, so that's not, a necessar not necessarily a surprising or interesting thing. You see the little downward uh, spikes in the, in the rising uh, areas, hard to do from here. Every, the Fleischmann and Pons run their electrochemical cells open. That is the products of electrolysis, in this case deuterium D2 gas and oxygen O2 gas, leave the cell. So they have to fill the cell every so often with the amount of heavy water that's left. So there's downward spikes are the um, times once each day when uh, heavy water was added to the cell to make up the lost electrolytes. So it goes down, it goes down, it goes down, it goes down. All of a sudden, one day it goes down a lot, and then it kicks up to a new level. It kicks up in temperature by what? 10 degrees? More. So all by itself at constant uh, input power and in steady operating systems, the cell suddenly started to produce 15 degrees more temperature. This clear evidence of excess heat, and it builds. Builds up, coming asymptoting at 100 degrees centigrade, so it comes up very close to the boiling point. And then all by itself, and this all by itself is why it's taken us 22 years to understand this thing. This all by itself, apparently, the cell uh, switched off and went back to its initial uh, trajectory. So. This result was available it was in the first patent that Fleischmann and Pons uh, applied for. This, this result was available for you know, discussion, interrogation. Thoughtful people looked at that and say, my God, uh, how can that possibly happen? And uh, all you need to do is wrap a calorimeter around that and measure the amount of heat to determine whether this is possible by any chemical scheme or not. The answer is it's absolutely not possible by any chemical scheme. This amount of heat is hundred or a thousand times more than you could get from the sum of all possible chemical reactions in that particular experiment. So we had this um, data available to us in early 1989, and we set up to uh, replicate this or something like it with funding from uh, the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI. Calorimeters come in all sort of shapes, sizes, uh, flavors, and whatever. Um, the commercial calorimeters. There are three SRI calorimeters on this uh, slide. The uh, one I'm going to talk about is a mass flow calorimeter. I'll talk about that in a little bit. The, um, uh, this is our most recent calorimeter, which is a phase change calorimeter. You measure heat by the change 
by boiling liquid nitrogen, basically. We know how much energy is, it takes to boil liquid nitrogen to make nitrogen gas. We measure the amount of gas flowing out, and we can do uh, calorimetry by that means. And in fact, it's an adaptation of the earliest calorimeter of all. This one, uh, an ice calorimeter developed by Lavoisier in France in the 1800s. This is a Seebeck calorimeter of ours. This is uh, Ed Storms, another uh, pioneer in the cold fusion field. And this is a, um, a commercial one. So I'm sorry. On the other side of the room. So, so this is the mass flow cal calorimeter I'm going to speak about. This is the gas calorimeter at SRI. This is another SRI calorimeter. This is an ice calorimeter, uh, bomb calorimeters, all sorts of forms and flavors of calorimeters. Hydrogen evolution reactions in under three minutes. So these uh, reactions that we're dealing with are, are so famous, they're in textbooks. They're so famous, they have names, and the names have faces. Um, so I put the faces up so you can see that basically all the electrochemist ever can do is to attract an ion from the solution. If it's a positively charged ion such as hydrogen, the proton, in solution, the acidic uh, part of uh, uh, water, all we can do is attract it to the surface, give it an electron, make it go from an H plus to an H atom adsorbed on the surface. What we want to do in cold fusion is have that hydrogen adsorbed atom uh, enter the uh, lattice. So what we have to do is build up a high concentration of adsorbed H, H atoms. Fighting against us are two processes. So, so so uh, Vollmer is a good guy. He's putting the um, hydrogen atom on the uh, surface of the electrochemist's uh, friend. Taffel reaction, two hydrogen atoms get together, form a hydrogen molecule, and bubble off the surface. A complete waste of time, uh, as far as we're concerned. Even worse, this Hirofsky reaction, a hydrogen atom will react with an already adsorbed hydrogen atom, one that we've patiently and carefully put down on the surface, it's consuming an electron in the process to make a hydrogen molecule. So this reaction's bad. This reaction's very bad. So, so we have to learn how to handle those three reactions in order to get the highest possible uh, chemical potential of hydrogen, concentration of hydrogen on the uh, electrified surface. The electrochemist has tremendous power in that he can control that uh, current and control the voltage. The voltage is a tremendous lever. We can load hydrogen into palladium in, uh, in concentrations that by electrochemistry and basically a, you know, a teacup or, or this, we can load the hydrogen or deuterium into palladium to an extent that would take 50 or 100,000 atmospheres of gas pressure in an apparatus that would fill a good fraction of this uh, room. So the electrochemist has uh, tremendous power he has to learn how to wield his electrochemistry. Electrochemistry, very sensitive to impurities. We found these reactions ran very much better in base in, in alkaline electrolytes. We used lithium hydroxide or lithium deuteroxide. And we developed a cell. Uh, it took us a while to develop it. But we found that the cell would only would, would meet all of our criteria if we, if we built it well and controlled it well and Fran Tanzella is in the room somewhere, is still using this uh, cell uh, today to load palladium. So basically, you put your palladium in the middle, a platinum counter electrode, fill it with uh, uh, heavy water and uh, lithium, LiOD, and the reactions occur, as I showed you before. High oxygen bubbles off the platinum, deuterium bubbles off the uh, um, palladium in the center here that which doesn't load, they recombine in the top. All of the cell is made out of uh, fused silica, quartz, not glass. Glass dissolves in, in alkaline electrolytes. So we have to make them out of uh, fused silica. The only components that we can put in those cells are Teflon, platinum, palladium, quartz, and alumina. Pretty much every other material known to man is poisonous to the electrochemical reactions. It dissolves, it etches, it slowly deposits on your cathode. You can't do what we need to do, which is to load it up. So you wrap that cell in a hermetic uh, closure. The, the 10 um, 
um, electrical connectors go through. It's basically a, apart from a submarine, a US submarine part, so we can submerge that thing and put it inside the calorimeter. Calorimeter is uh, here. I'll go over here for a change. So this calorimeter is placed in a constant temperature bath in a constant temperature room in order to measure the um, temperatures and therefore heats accurately. We need a very well-defined uh, temperature environment. So water is drawn from the bath. It goes down the annular space on the outside, turns the corner, goes past our electrochemical cell. So we measure the temperature with two temperature sensors on the inlet, two or four temperature sensors on the outlet. So all we need to know is what is the temperature difference? What is the mass, the flow rate? How many grams per second of water is going through that uh, calorimeter? And what is the heat capacity of that water, which is 4.186 uh, joules per gram of air-saturated water? <clears throat> 